Nā mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. Warm greetings to you all. I'd like to welcome everyone here today to the precarious academic work report launch. I'm Luke Oldfield, one of a dozen odd people who have made contributions to the Tertiary Education Action Group, Aotearoa, and I've been asked by the group to facilitate proceedings this evening. I'd like to take the opportunity, first of all, to apologise to our attendees, our prospective attendees, many of whom have been unable to attend on such short notice, and our panellists, uh, who have all collectively suffered through the two prior cancellations of this event as Omicron took hold. Uh, we have uh, been able to get a time locked in and successfully move things online, and I'm grateful to those uh, who have assisted uh, with that in recent weeks. Nonetheless, uh, tonight's presentation brings to light the lived experiences of precarious academic workers, that is, tutors, research assistants, contract lecturers, equity providers, postdoctoral scholars, among others within our eight universities in this country. Increasingly, these are roles which academic workers are doing for long periods of time, and often long after their qualifications, in some cases their doctoral qualifications, are completed. Our report, released in February, Elephant in the Room, which is available on FigShare, suggests that an increasingly large number of highly qualified people feel trapped within a system of low wages and few opportunities, all while chasing an academic career which is increasingly less likely to materialise. That is, unless they are willing to make themselves available to work hundreds of extra hours per year without sufficient remuneration. All of this, of course, makes the precarious academic worker more vulnerable to exploitation. This evening's event is the culmination of 12 months of work from a variety of stakeholders and researchers across the Motu. So before we get started, it would be prudent at this moment to acknowledge the large number of people who have fed into the survey design, data collection, analysis, report building, uh, and of course, today's presentation. First off the bat, the New Zealand Union of Students Associations, and particularly Liam Davies, Alan Dixon, and Andrew Bessels. A wide variety of people also at the Tertiary Education Union, uh, we wish to acknowledge specifically the National Secretary, Dr. Sandra Gray. Within the Academy, Dr. Lara Greaves, Dr. Zoe Port, Dr. Lucy Stewart, who along with Max Saw, uh, was one of, actually one of our report writers uh, and had we been presenting in person today in Wellington, it would have also been one of our presenters. Thank you to them. I also wish to acknowledge those behind the scenes at the Centre for Cultural Centred Research and Evaluation at Massey University, uh, who have in recent weeks assisted us with bringing this event online after our two failed attempts in person. I uh, also wish to acknowledge our panellists today, Dr. Sidiana Napi, University of Auckland, Professor Mohan Dutta, Massey University, and the MP for Auckland Central, uh, Chloe Schraubrook. And finally, those 760 precarious academic workers who responded to our survey in October 2021, providing us with the vital empirical data that underpinned the report and the recommendations which followed. Before launching into the panel, uh, we will be hearing from some of the report authors, Dr. Richard Pornaroy, who is a research fellow at the University of Auckland and is speaking to us about the lived experience of navigating life as an international postgraduate student in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The following Ritu will be Dr. Amy Simpson and April Jafoli Simpson, the two report lead authors who will take us through some of the key findings. After which Dr. Leon Salter will spotlight some of the key recommendations of our report ahead of our panellists who will take centre stage in about 40 minutes time. Over to you, Dr. Roy. Nā mihi nui, kia kato katoa. Kia ora everyone. Academic precarity in Aotearoa, New Zealand is a systemic issue um, in which demands a systemic change. However, we often forget the human individuals who endure the impacts of a broken or failed system. I'm going to talk about or share some insights along with personal anecdotes today that will illuminate the human misery uh, caused by a broken system. 
When we think of precarity in academia, we largely refer to um, the employment insecurity, whereas the precarity experienced by the international um, students are multifaceted. Um, one, many scholars have described it as hyper precarity or extended precarity. For international students, precarity extends beyond employment uh, to key three forms, legal, economic, and social. The legal precarity comes from their uh, non-citizenry or uh, temporary migrant status, um, the complications and the vulnerability associated with their uh, visa, visa status. Economic precarity, of course, refers to the employment and financial vulnerability. Social precarity, on the other hand, is often caused by the factors such as language barrier, um, lack of social capital, uh, or say, for example, the racism or any kind of hostility targeted to them. Now, the legal and economic precarity are intertwined and it heightens their experience of vulnerability. Non-citizenary status uh, precludes them from accessing local supports or resources that are usually available to uh, permanent residents or citizen uh, in New Zealand who are precariously employed in academia. So for example, the visa status makes it very difficult to find a decent job in and outside of academia to support themselves, ultimately leaving them uh, vulnerable to exploitation at work. Next slide, please. Now, the question is, uh, what does this hyper uh, precarity or extended precarity mean for international students? It means you work without any pay um, sometimes. So my first job in New Zealand when I arrived as an international student was a cleaning one. Um, I was asked to do cleaning at a primary school over a weekend uh, for which I didn't get paid. And I was told that I wasn't required anymore um, after that weekend. So I later realized that uh, the cleaning company owner needed someone to cover for just that weekend. So that's why I was called. So I was new to the country and I was honor of my rights and entitlement and lack of social support and knowledge. So I didn't know where to go with that and who to complain about that situation. Uh, and that's exactly what I was referring to previously about uh, when I talked about uh, the social precarity that international students face along with economic and legal precarity. Um, it also means working under the table jobs for as low as $10 per hour. My second job uh, at Auckland was working in a convenience store for $10 per hour. Luckily, later I moved on to a tutoring job in academia. So basically I managed to move from the worst form of exploitation to a less exploitative arrangement. Working on casual contracts in academia meant that I wasn't entitled for any sick leave or annual leave. It meant I needed to wait and suffer to carefully plan my two major surgeries during my PhD uh, for the se semester or mid-semester breaks to keep myself uh, financially afloat. I couldn't suspend my PhD for health reasons as suspension of my enrollment would have meant that would have impacted my um, visa status and thereby my entitlement to work at New Zealand would have been impacted as well. Uh, just for your information, uh, my PhD was self-financed. I was by no means the worst off. I have friends and colleagues who have taken up jobs of cleaning, landscaping, or envelope stuffing, even with a PhD. Uh, after finishing their PhD, they have done these jobs. I, in 2000, 2020, I taught um, a cohort of postgraduate students, predominantly of international students, who were middle of the pandemic, who were continuously working extra hours and shifts so that they can send money to their family where the pandemic has wreaked havoc. After enduring all of this, um, I think the worst part comes 
when you don't know that you will be able to stay in this country or uh, become a citizen in this country or your contribution to the economy and the knowledge community will ever be recognized. Uh, just to plug in here, international education is a $5 billion sector, uh, making its nation's fifth largest export earner and supporting around 45,000 jobs in Aotearoa. Now, this, combining these two factors, on one hand, because of this neoliberal reform uh, to the universities and tertiary sectors and chronic underfunding from the successive governments, university and tertiary institutions started heavily relying on high international student fees. So there is hyper reliance on international tuition, student tuition fees. And on the other hand, there is this hyper uh, precariousness that international students experience. These two factors actually poses the question of ethic, ethical standard in the practice of tertiary sector in New Zealand. Now, I will leave to you to ponder on that, whether our international students are being treated as cash cows in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, for giving us those insights into work, study and life for international students. Um, some alarming information, I'm sure, for many um, on what happens both inside uh, and outside our, our learning institutions here in Aotearoa and New Zealand for those uh, recent uh, international students. Uh, next, we have Dr Amy Simpson and Dr April Jafoli Simpson, who are going to take us through um, some of the specifics in the report findings of you both. Kia ora everyone and uh, thanks Luke for handing that over. Um, so I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, uh, start us off by just talking about uh, the method and the sort of survey design. So I think one of the things to note um, is that uh, we only sampled uh, universities. So just so that we're clear that this doesn't include uh, polytechnics or wānanga or uh, Crown Research Institutes either, uh, who are also part of the um, sort of tertiary sector. Um, and that came down to the fact that uh, as sort of researchers and activists, that wasn't our experience. Um, and so um, I really encourage people in those um, environments to do something similar um, to see and identify like the issues that are happening for them there. Um, so in terms of this uh, survey, we had basically uh, two criteria uh, for people to be uh, eligible for this survey. Uh, the first was that they had to be over 18 um, and they also had to have identified as being precariously employed uh, at a university in New Zealand in the last 12 months. Um, so we asked a whole bunch of different questions for a period of four weeks. Um, and in that time, as Luke said, we had uh, 760 responses, which was just huge. Um, and we asked uh, questions about people's, the nature of people's employment agreements, um, their workplace conditions, uh, their views on academia, their health and well-being, etc. cetera. Um, so we're just gonna rip through uh, some of the findings. The report is available on Figshare. And at this point, many of you have probably already seen it. So I don't need to stay too long. Next slide, please. Um, so overall, um, we just generally, ended up doing some myth busting, um, I guess, about uh, the status of um, precarious work. Um, so that the idea really that uh, precarious work uh, is short term transitory roles uh, that are a normal or natural part of a career progression within the academic sector. I think anybody who has uh, worked for any kind of period of time as a tutor or a research assistant uh, can sometimes sort of see that that's not necessarily the case. Um, and uh, we can really see that in terms of the findings that we had, right? Like that uh, almost a third of our uh, participants had been employed in these kinds of roles for more than five years. So I think that that's quite stark. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the biggest findings I think that we had was about the level of um, uh, underpayment people perceived. So the idea that um, 
over a half of people said that they uh, never or occasionally um, uh, felt that oh, that their employment agreements didn't account for the hours that they had worked uh, never or occasionally, I think is quite stark when you think about um, what they're supposed to account for. Um, and next slide, please. All this to you, April. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so in our report, uh, we divided up our findings into some theme sections based on some of the things we were really interested in learning more about. Um, and one of those things was equity. We were really interested in seeing if we could understand some of those uh, layers of inequity, inequality um, that exist um, in the system. And so on this slide, you can see some of the overall findings. Uh, you can see that around a quarter of um, the participants we had who were Māori or Pacifica were also students at the same time. Um, and around two thirds of deaf or disabled participants uh, were in uh, casual or fixed term agreements for less than six months as their highest paying role. So what that indicates is that the contracts uh, they were on were quite short, um, meaning you uh, kind of always worrying about where the next one is coming from and you have no ability to plan for for the future. Um, and also uh, linking back to what Ritu mentioned before, um, over half of the participating international students uh, were not confident about having sufficient work over the next 12 months at a university. Um, this was an experience that was common among many participants, um, but particularly common among this group. Next slide, please. So uh, this uh, graph that you can see on the page, um, it shows whether uh, people in diff different ethnic groups in the samples, um, whether they were currently enrolled as students, um, enrolled as PhD students, or if they were post PhD. And what you can see is that the proportion of people uh, who responded to our survey who were currently enrolled as uh, students Many of them were Māori and Pacific peoples. And we had uh, fewer Māori and Pacific peoples further up in the academic pipeline, as you may call it. Um, and while we can't make strong conclusions here because our samples were too small to do the types of statistical analyses we would like to, um, this finding really supports other findings from recently published research suggesting that there are some problems with the academic pi uh, pipeline in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and we need to invest more in um, training and retaining um, our early career academics. Back to you, Amy. Muted. Of course, of course. It's like live stream bingo. I can't believe it. Anyway, um, so yeah, so one of the thing the thing the, the stark findings that we had uh was the high uh, proportion of our sample that was students. So over half of our um sample were currently enrolled students um, and I think that that suggests something interesting about uh, that we need to think about uh, students as also being employees of their education providers um, and what that means in terms of their ability to kind of uh, safely articulate their experience um, and to advocate for themselves um, and kind of what what is complicated about uh, for instance if you're a, a, a thesis student um, and your supervisor is also your boss so how do those things kind of interact and I think that that would be something that would be really nice to hear from the panelists about um, if we go to the next slide, one of our uh, thoughts uh, was uh, that we offer stipends for uh, PhD students. And this is all often something that's touted that uh, we have um, sometimes uh, guaranteed uh, stipends. So we were curious to see how much of an impact stipends had uh, on the students who received them. And I thought what was interesting about this is that the distribution in terms of how many uh, uh, casual or fixed term agreements um, PhD students had worked didn't really differ uh, in terms of whether or not they received a stipend or not. Um, so that sort of suggests perhaps that stipends are set at like 
at a level that um, isn't enough to really support them and that people are having to do quite significant levels of work on top of a stipend um, as well. If you go to the next slide, please. And that's sort of supported by uh, this graph which occurs earlier in the report, um, which suggests that our uh, the majority of our participants um, engaged in this kind of work primarily for financial need. Um, that was ranked as sort of being a really important factor for people. Um, and that was followed by uh, career advancement. Um, but really, uh, I think that the focus on uh, financial need is sort of uh, kind of systematic of the way that we're maybe not supporting um, our students and supporting our uh, employees in the best way that we can. Next slide, please. This is you, April, I believe. I was just checking. You look like you were going to speak. <laughs> so in the next section of the report, um, we looked at staff health and wellbeing and we asked questions about um, the current stress levels um, of people who um, answered our survey um, and also their experiences of things like discrimination, bullying and harassment. Um, and we found some quite um, shocking responses. Um, we, from our own experiences, we expected to find um, that people were stressed or having adverse experiences, um, but we found that um, almost two thirds of participants rated their current stress level at a seven out of 10 or higher, which is, a lot of stress. Uh, about a third had experienced discrimination, bullying or harassment in the workplace. Um, and four fifths of the participants who were affected by that um, discrimination or harassment um, couldn't speak out or felt like they couldn't speak out um, because of fear of repercussions. Um, and we believe that that could be tied to the precarious nature of their um, work arrangements, which means that um, you're disempowered from speaking out about things because it might jeopardise your employment opportunities. Um, next slide, please. And so this is just a depiction of the stress levels uh, question that I spoke about. And so you can see there's quite a sharp peak um, at around seven and eight um, out of 10. Next slide. So finally, um, uh, at the moment, we can't escape COVID-19, so it would be uh, negligent of us not to consider uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected um, things uh, for precarious academic workers. And so we did uh, get some interesting findings in terms of the impact that increased working from home had had on people's finances um, or the loss or disruption uh, in employment due to COVID-19. So people reported experiences like being promised work and then that work not going ahead and um, then losing out in, in that way. Um, and troublingly, around two thirds of participants weren't confident that if something similar was to occur again, that their employer would be able to adequately support them. So perhaps we need a bit more forward planning. Um, but I think the most interesting thing to reflect on from this is that COVID-19 exacerbated problems, sure, but those problems already existed. Um, and really the pandemic has just put a bit of a spotlight on um, the situation experienced um, by people in these roles. Next slide. That's us. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy and April. And, and look, it's certainly telling that we've uh, you know, been two and a half years into a pandemic now and we saw billions of dollars uh, shuffled out the door uh, for wage subsidies uh, to support businesses. Um, and I think the, the general consensus there is that that, that money was necessary. Uh, at the same time, um, very little support for students. Um, we had a government that had indicated in the leading into the 2017 election that they would reinstate a postgraduate student allowance six months into the pandemic. They were quite happy to say that they weren't going to be doing that. Uh, in fact, the only thing I recall uh, of significance during my studies, and I'm sure many of you uh, will recall this as well, is the opportunity from um, government to borrow more money uh, by way of course related costs. Um, and for those of you like myself that are watching long today, you're probably thinking, I don't need another $1,000 on a $100,000 debt, uh, but there we are. Uh, so thank you both uh, for your insights. and.
Uh, as Amy and April said, uh, by no means an exhaustive presentation to the data that was in the report. Um, if you would like to see more of the data, please have a look. Google elephant in the room fig share, and it's the first result. Um, and then there will also be some other data that is, or information publications, which are released later this year that make use of this uh, survey data. Ah, moving forward, uh, Leon will now spotlight some of the key recommendations from our report. Over to you, Leon. Kia ora, thanks, Luke. Yeah, so I'm just going to keep it quite short and sweet, present a, an abridged version of the recommendations that are on the report, trying to bring some together. So for, first and foremost, I guess it's an obvious one, right? J increased job security. It, it's a report about precarious work. Um, and, and we argue that precarious working conditions are not the inevitable result of government underfunding. While there is government underfunding, there's no doubt. There's also a culture of casualization within universities and if university managers really care about the health and well-being of their staff then this needs to be addressed and we also want although we want sort of people coming off these precarious contracts for those that have to remain on fixed term um, and casual contracts we also want them to be actually paid for the hours that they work um, as April and Amy talked about, um, half over half of the participants stated that their employment ingredient, um, agreements either never or only occasionally accurately accounted for the hours that they worked, um, which is a worrying trend and um, adds to the sort of precarious nature of, of their work. And also we want precarious workers filling in for permanent staff that have teaching buyout um, to be actually paid the full amount allocated to that buyout um, without universities, you know, pocketing the difference and making a profit from that, which seems to be happening quite a lot. And finally, address structural racism. We found um, evidence that this system furthers that structural racism contributing to other research, which has argued that pathways for Mali and Pacifica are broken. Um, and a, as April and Amy talked about, both Mali and Pacifica participants are current, were currently enrolled students, um, had high um, rates of, that were co uh, currently enrolled students, 77.4% for Mali and 76.9% for Pacifica. S taking teaching or research contracts to supplement their studies, right? Um, and the majority of those students, 47.6% of Mali and 57.7% of Pacifica, were enrolled on non-PhD courses, um, compared to just 25.8% of Pakiha. And as pa um, PhD study is the recognized path into academia and the necessity to take on multiple precarious contracts while studying, we argue could be impeding that path um, for those groups. And on top of that, over one third of Māori Pacific uh, participants were required to perform duties outside of their job description. And we also want to um, end what has been described by some researchers as the cultural double shift, acknowledge the cultural roles and responsibilities taken up by precariously employed Māori staff, create specific cultural adv advisor roles that are resourced to assist with these tasks. And as Ritu mentioned, support international students during and after study. International students deserve fair accreditation for overseas studies and experience, giving them equal access to employment opportunities on arrival. Universities should offer basic access to services such as the library over a post-study period and the ability to conduct research. They are paying quite a bit in fees after all. And then just three priorities for government. Um, we want investigations into workloads, bullying and structural racism. Firstly, uh, workloads. Almost half of participants suggest an unsustainable workload, often or always negatively impacting their health and well-being. 
The workloads of precarious academic staff encroach significantly on their lives. The extent of the sector-wide problem of overworking needs to be independently and transparently investigated. <clears throat> and bullying, most participants who experienced discrimination, bullying, harassment in their workplaces indicated a fear of repercussions stopped them from speaking out at least some of the time. And an independent investigation instigated by government could begin to address that obvious power imbalance and structural racism to take seriously the long-term and growing evidence of embedded racism through a properly resourced investigation across the eight universities in Aotearoa. And financial hardship, half of students said the financial need was a very important factor as why they engaged in precarious work. So a simple solution would be reinstating the postgraduate student allowance so students wouldn't be so reliant on taking on these exploitative contracts, create pathways out of student debt. Over a quarter of participants borrowed more on their student loans on top of working precariously. The student loan system has further indebted the precarious academic workforce. Highly skilled graduates remaining out in Aotearoa should be entitled to greater debt relief post study and tailor a plan for precarious workers facing hardship. As a result of the pandemic, more than half of the participants experienced increased living costs and over a third experienced disruptions to their employment. As Luke touched on, the absence of a wage subsidy during the pandemic, coupled with university cost cutting measured measures, left many precarious academic workers unable to support themselves. A future government response to a future crisis should be immediate and not one that burdens the students in early career researchers with further debt. And finally, this might be more a long term utopian aim, but nevertheless vital return to the idea of universities as public institutions. The various findings in this report underline how a business oriented universities have diminished the welfare prospects and status of postgraduates and early career researchers. Precarious academic work is siloed and itemized, creating distance between precarious workers and the university ecosystem and keeping them vulnerable. We need legislation to minimize the use of casual employment agreements in universities, providing greater protections to the financial well-being of these academics. Okay, that's that's me. Kia ora, Leon. Thank you so much for that. Um, I um, just want to, to reiterate what, what Leon said at the top of his uh, two slides there, that they are three uh, of the eight recommendations we had for each for government uh, and for universities. And I think I might also just take the opportunity here to, to get ahead of uh, uh, criticism that we might have levelled at, at these recommendations, uh, particularly if you think about the fact that a large number of precarious workers in academia are students. And many people will say, well, you know, students are uh, perhaps completing their qualification and they're going to go on uh, into the workforce, and in some cases that uh, outside of academia. In some cases that might be true. Um, but it doesn't mean necessarily that even if you're only in academia for a short time, uh, that you should be subject to uh, some such power imbalances or subject to situations where you're not necessarily being properly remunerated for the work that you're doing. Uh, one thing that we are advocating for is we are possible to, to uh, unwind precarity uh, but also in some cases where it's appropriate, and this might be most appropriate with students, uh, but to create an environment where uh, contracts are, are, are less precarious um, and are more accommodating to the needs of, of students. And so one example that we have given in our discussions with the unions and, and with politicians is that we would like to see volunteer roles, for example, uh, where a student, an honest student, might be asked to do something uh, to and that volunteer role, they're offered a, a sausage roll or an ice cream, that they actually get paid casually for that. So they might get a, um, a small amount of pay for showing up and helping out, for example, with a, a careers expo at the university. Um, what we're asking also is that with some of these tutoring contracts, uh, it, instead of perhaps having a student work, and this might be a PhD student spending four years at an institution, working semester to semester, uh, 
uh, but for that individual to be contracted for a, for a full 12 months. We don't think that that is, is, is too much to ask. Uh, and then also, um, it would be, it'd be advantageous, we believe, to, to maintaining high quality people, uh, highly qualified uh, and competent academics in the country uh, if we were to reform our, our research sector. And obviously there is conversations going on about how that might best take place into the future. Uh, so thank you, Leon, uh, and thank you also for uh, those presenters that, that preceded him. Moving forward from the report findings and the recommendations, we've assembled a panel of three exciting and committed change agents within the sector. Chloe Schraubrick, uh, MP for Auckland Central, who is the tertiary education spokesperson for the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand. Kia ora, welcome Chloe. Dr. Siriana Napi, who is a sociologist and specialises in uh, equity issues in, in the tertiary sector. Kia ora, Siriana. Uh, and Professor Mohan uh, Dutta, who is a professor of communication at Massey University and director of the Centre for a Cultural Centred Approach to Approaches to Research and Evaluation. Welcome to the three of you. Kia ora. Uh, Sidiana, uh, I think I'll, I'll start uh, with you, perhaps. Um, we only have a, a small number of questions here, if people are wondering, just in the interests of time. But um, I have noted some things, and we'll do this in a sort of semi-structured way. So, Sidiana, I think I'll, we might actually start with you, perhaps. We hear from universities across the MOTU that they are on a mission to bring diversity to the faculty. Uh, so that our students are taught by a, a wide variety or a wide range of people from different backgrounds. Um, and that, I think, you know, we would all argue that is a, a noble goal. Um, how would you say that precarious work in academia undermines or, or runs counter to that, that diversity goal? Um, first of all, thank you, Luke, and I will, uh, you know, those are those are my trigger words, diversities, universities and commitments, but I will try and stick to your point around um, precariously employed. I think what's really important is that we we think about um, our long term commitment is to grow an academy that reflects Aotearoa. So we're putting in all these different investment points to ensure that Māori and Pacific um, get PhDs, get full time jobs and kind of go through an academic pipeline that a number of research papers have shown is fundamentally broken. And what's really interesting around the precarity is that Māori and Pacific are more likely to be precarious. And if we look at kind of the rumblings that are happening in the sector at the moment, um, the MB Green Paper submissions, if you look up um, the, the if you look up, um, there was a Māori and Pacific ECR submission. Um, and if you look up Te Koringa, they are saying, we don't think we want this, <laughs> um, right? And, and I think that that's something that really has to settle into people's brains is that at the moment, the way that Māori and Pacific ECRs are being taught and being treated means that they really don't think they want to stay in the sector. And so you can have all of the like the best kind of um, career development, wonderful posters, really more meaningful policy. But if you don't address the fundamental issue of how do I pay my rent while I do this job, Māori and Pacific will go elsewhere. There's a high demand for well-qualified Māori and Pacific researchers, and they will join ministries, they will join iwi research groups, they will set up their own consultancies. And so it's really important that the universities kind of recognise this, that they have a role to play in Māori and Pacific dropping out of that pipeline. Um, and just sort of generally, that sort of independent inquiry into racism in our institutions has to happen. And as a sort of side piece to that, that means that we will start talking about precarity in the academy really seriously, because until we have this conversation, nothing will fundamentally change. We allow our institutions to sort of slowly and politely let a few Māori and Pacific in as they increase things by 1%, 2%, 3%. And the radical change we need means we have to have an open conversation about the types of racism that Māori and Pacific experience, including that they are more likely to be precarious. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Sidiana. Uh, and if I was to very briefly summarise there, what you're saying is we need to see substance over form. You know, and we actually need to see um, uh, structural changes uh, or conversations that will allow for structural changes in our institutions. This might be an appropriate time to bring you in, Mohan. You've ascended to the role of professor uh, and have had thus far an illustrious career. Uh, 
Uh, perhaps with the equity question in mind, if possible, what would you say are the roles and responsibilities of professors uh, to ensure that the next generation of aspiring academics can be meaningfully employed in the sector? Kiara, Luke, I think, you know, first I want to acknowledge your report and some of the striking things that I see in the report and that are really concerning. You know, I work sort of on one end of the spectrum with low wage, hyper precarious migrant workers in places like Singapore and Dubai. And what I find really striking in your report is the similarities in the condition of hyper precarity in terms of the uncertainty and the kind of uncertainty that Dr. Roy was um, uh, sharing and how that actually uh, reflects uh, trafficking, labor trafficking conditions um, that uh, seem to uh, plague the um, education sector. So thinking about uh, sort of the kinds of responses, particularly for those of us that are in positions of um, uh, privilege as full professors, I think there are sort of three kinds of responses I would like to offer. One is sort of thinking through at the micro level in terms of the kinds of infrastructures of uh, care, the resources for care and the resources for support, you know, all the way from uh, support for um, food, um, given the challenges of food insecurity often um, that we see in the precariat and the academe, uh, resources for um, uh, housing support and um, infrastructure support within that context. And moving from that to MISO level support, such as um, uh, pathways of complaining, you know, something your report highlighted is how often um, uh, do the precariat and the academe not know what the policies are, where to go to, where to raise complaints. And one of the things that have consistently seen within the university setting is how often uh, the pathways to raising complaints are simply shut down. So I think as um, uh, professors, we have important roles to play in terms of uh, generating the pedagogy for actually how to complain, but also placing our bodies on the line in witnessing the struggles and in agitating against uh, the structure. And then at the very uh, macro level, I want to point out the role of advocacy, particularly in terms of your call for turning back the clock and moving universities into public institutions. I think there is a lot to be done in terms of challenging the casualization of the workforce, particularly in terms of uh, refusing. Refusal is a vital strategy, so refusing to um, uh, work with or engage or employ um, uh, part-time casual workers, advocating for more uh, full-time roles, and more broadly then uh, thinking through the ways in which the university can one hand build infrastructures to support the precariat and on the other hand uh, sort of um, address the managerial overload where we seem to uh, be bombarded with a management structure that sucks up a lot of resources and creates uh, much more additional work without really um, enabling pathways of support. Some comments there at the end there about, thank you, Professor, some comments there at the end there about managerialism in our universities and a certain book by um, by uh, Mr. Graber, uh, Dr. Graber springs to mind from 10 years ago. I won't repeat the title of the book because it might not be appropriate for the stream, but um, thank you for that. And, and I just some of the words you said uh, stuck out at me uh, there. You mentioned trafficking. Um, it might be something that our unions uh, wish to take up in their holistic uh, advocacy um, and how the sector might be reformed. Um, can I just ask a very quick supplementary question to you, Professor? And, you know, you, you touched on other countries there. You've worked as a professor in other countries. Uh, do you think this kind of, you know, uberfication, if you will, of, of academic labour, is this something that you think is more pronounced here than in other places that you've worked? Or do you think that this is, is at global at this level? Sorry, you're just on mute, Professor. You know, it does seem to be a global phenomenon. Um, having said that, there seem to be particular aspects that are quite specific to um, El Terua. One is, you know, what I think of as the immobility of academic work. So it is really striking how often academics are taken into positions and particularly Maori, Pacifica, uh, international academics with the drive toward um, uh, uh, diversity and the narrative of diversity as a market uh, 
without really pathways into the professoriate and into the ac academe. So what you really have here is disposable labor. You know, I'm really struck by how often as uh, the graduate students, people then end up working in the kinds of uh, dirty disposable uh, jobs, which do not really have a future. And uh, aligned with that, then I also wanted to uh, say, you know, what seems to be really striking in Neoterwa is the absence of uh, structures for raising complaint and formally addressing complaints. It's, it's really quite interesting. There seems to be a broader culture of um, addressing conflicts through mediation or, or some kind of form of mediation. What that essentially does is that it um, ends up and upholds power in ways that um, further um, entrench the experiences of um, hyper precarity. So those elements to me seem to be very particular to the context of um, El Terroir. Kia ora, thank you, Professor. Um, I just wanted to bring you into the conversation uh, now, Chloe. So the report covers responses from participants uh, at each of, of New Zealand's eight universities, which suggests to me uh, that this is a, a systemic issue and, and Mohan has just indicated uh, that it's a uh, perhaps a, a global issue to some extent as well. And we certainly have evidence of that, um, that we have you know a, a global academic workforce that's on a cycle of precarity I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, Aotearoa New Zealand, we've sort of become a country that's uh, been upheld as, as you know, uh, on a global stage in, in the last couple of years for, for doing some things right, um, at least um, during the pandemic. How does New Zealand carve out its own path here? You know, what practical steps ought to be taken to ensure that we don't have in this country thousands of people who don't, or who, who continue to remain on the, on the treadmill of precarity? Oh, kia ora. Um, and can I also say um, big nia to uh, everybody who produced this report uh, and also, as you yourself, Luke, has already said, everybody who um, kind of bared their souls and I'm sure their traumas uh, to contribute to this research. Uh, so I think uh, what's resonated with me amongst all of it uh, is what was just said before, you know, if you can't pay your rent, how are you supposed to even think about how you're going to survive through study, let alone through work? So, um, look, you mentioned earlier that uh, in response to COVID-19, um, I remember it really vividly, I had been trying to negotiate uh, with our uh, government minister for education, who um, himself uh, prides himself on having been a former student president uh, and having advocated for a lot of the positions with that, which now seem to have fallen by the wayside. Uh, we were working towards the reinstatement of postgraduate student allowance and, of course, uh, the kind of extension of fees free, um, not quite going the full hog and doing the public institution, uh, but nonetheless, that kind of uh, more incremental centrism uh, that we've seen become the pattern of doing government over the past wee while. And it was one of the most anger inducing, and I think it's perhaps still uh, the most strongly worded press release that I've ever signed off uh, that went out uh, that day in 2020 when in the COVID-19 emergency budget, the government announced that when it was signing out billions of dollars to go towards businesses uh, and wage subsidies and through the IRD, that it was simultaneously also going to be putting on the chopping block, the reinstatement of postgraduate student allowance and the extension of fees free to a sector and to a populace who obviously so desperately needed it. Uh, they decided that the response would look like, as you also alluded to, the extension of course related costs. Course related costs for those um, who uh, I'm sure everybody who's tuned in is aware, but uh, are only uh, open to students who are studying full time and they are an extension of debt. Uh, and I think that it is also incredibly naive for any politician or supposed representative to try and pretend as though it's a course related cost when we know full well that these things are going on groceries, they're going on people's rents and essentials and bills. There was also uh, the rollout of a hardship fund for learners, which went directly to each of the 120 odd institutions, including some of the private training establishments. And we saw massive issues there with regard to how each of the institutions interpreted uh, how they were going to get this out to students. And we saw that many students um, and students who also happened to be staff uh, having to bear again their souls and showcase just how poor they were in order to get support and heard from a huge number of people who were still denied that support too. So um, look, when you ask me about what kind of practical steps can we take to carve out our own path here in Aotearoa, um, that for me prompts uh, 
a bit of reflection on how actually uh, the problem that we've got ourselves in with regard to this precariousness and with regard to the continued kind of sense of seeing our, um, uh, our tertiary institutions as through more of a corporate or commercial or privatised lens is driven by uh, an ideology that likes to see itself as practical. <laughs> so like, that's to define what we're talking about when we're talking about practical. Uh, when we're talking about practical in the direction of the values that we see education as a public good and that we don't want people to be trapped in that cycle of precariarity, uh, then I think that we're talking about how do we get people to organise. Uh, and that is a really challenging task in front of us when everybody is just so exhausted trying to survive. And I ask then about the kind of feedback loop uh, and how we break that feedback loop. Well, we break that feedback loop by producing solidarity. And that comes about by virtue of the shared experiences that this report is a foundation of, and hopefully more and more people getting involved and engaged. Because I'll tell you for a fact, uh, trying to push forward on uh, kind of particularly for students, but also for staff inside of tertiary institutions over the past few years in parliament, it's been a very lonely place. So we need a lot, lot more louder voices on the outside. Sure, thank you, Chloe. Um, and so you're speaking to the, uh, um, you know, we have a at best incrementalism going on. Uh, we have a contradiction between uh, education as a public good and, and uh, I guess this uh, neoliberalism uh, that has uh, uh, continued uh, almost um, uncontrollably uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then an, under, an underlying audit culture as well, which obviously is a function of neoliberalism, which is made uh, for students particularly difficult if they do need to uh, access support, um, particularly when you have, as you say, inconsistencies across each of the institutions. Thank you for that. I, um, Sidiana, I just wanted to um, sort of delve back into what I note in the data capture, uh, where we talk about you know education as a public right and, uh, uh, and the importance of education. Uh, what we noted, and this wasn't in the report itself, uh, but will uh, be su supplement in, in future publications, uh, that a majority of precarious academic workers believe universities value research ahead of teaching and service. So um, those of you that are familiar with the academic environments or an academic job, typically uh, research, teaching and service are, are the three you know, key components of the job. So my question to Diana is, what do you think the driver of this is, this overemphasis on research above all else, um, again, part of the audit culture? Uh, and how do you think we will get more balance uh, so that these three roles uh, of an academic are equally valued? Um, when when, when yeah, I saw this was a question coming my way, I spent quite a bit of time kind of thinking about it. It's one of those things that makes me really angry, to be honest, um, because there are fantastic teachers out there who just because they teach or they, they pour their energy into teaching, they can't get permanent or they can't get promoted because their research side is not, is, isn't where the university wants it to be in terms of international progression or um, PB, like, you know, there's the, is it a PBA referable output? Um, as a higher education researcher, I'm constantly telling anyone I can talk to that you can you can write a research paper on your teaching and that counts as a PBI referable output. The problem that we've got is that it just fun, fundamentally the institution doesn't want to shift this, right? So um, there's these external drivers. So PBRF is one piece of it. Um, th the thing they can change is research income. So they can't change the amount of um, students that can come through the door. There's a cap on that. Um, they'll only get funded so many. In fact, if you go over the number of students that the government has allocated you, the university sees that as a loss because they're then having to subsidize um, that student's enrollment. And I, I, I do this because it's like, the accounting of universities is something that's really interesting. And um, after the Rutherford, that's how I'm gonna spend some time looking at the books. Um, but they, they argue that this is, the, they can't change that right but if they can get every academic to pick up a research contract that's income that they hadn't accounted for if that makes sense so they can't change the student income but they can change the research income through overheads and we can see with mb the mb green paper that that's um something that's in scope is what are overheads what do they look like and how are institutions making money off them but fundamentally i, I think i do want to come back to chloe and mohan's point that 
none of this is going to change unless we have collective action. And I think a collective action for refusal is a really interesting politic because we spend a lot of time complaining about the institution and then we go and do what it wants us to do anyway. And partly that's, you know, I'm a first generation academic. I would like to feed my children and afford Auckland. That means I need to tick off certain boxes to move up the ladder. But what worries me is when we pull the ladder up behind us. And so I think this collective action moment and this raising of voices is really important to disrupt how we think about research, teaching and service. So when that white paper comes out, because after the green paper, there's a white paper. I'm learning so much about things now. Um, when that comes out, feed into it as much as you can. When the election cycles out, feed into it as much as you can, that you want our universities to be places that under law, under law, you were meant to be taught to be a university as a student, you are meant to be taught by researchers. That's the deal. That's what makes us a university under our sort of under our teaching and edu um, our, te our education and training act. So demand that. Demand that those researchers that are bringing in lots of money to the university are also good teachers because that's what that's what a university is. And I think we've forgotten that piece. And I, again, collective action I think is the way to go here between our students and our staff. Surely, surely we can take on, um, you know, the government, the universities, times higher education ranking systems. Just general world domination would be great in terms of that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> thanks, Luke. Yeah. Well, the thing is, Eliana, and you've touched on the ranking systems, which uh, I've often referred to as being the Death Star that needs blowing up. You know, um, it is what is that. Um, you know, these ranking systems, which, you know, the government then aligns its policies on, uh, which then has the downstream consequences of things like PBRF, which leads to precarity, particularly in teaching and teaching related roles. I just have a personal anecdote there, just touching on what you said, Sidiana. I, I had a, a meeting with a, 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 some government, uh, or should I say, de departmental or ministry officials a few months ago, and, and they said to me straight off the bat that it was their understanding uh, that people that do lots of research are the best teachers. Um, and I thought to myself, well, um, sometimes that's true and sometimes it's very not true. Um, and so perhaps, it, you know, some degree of education in terms of uh, the ministry understanding, the ministry's understanding uh, some of the complexities of academia and where some strengths are and where they're not um, is, would be useful. I also liked your points about solidarity there uh, to perhaps push back on some of these perverse outcomes. Mohan, I, I want just to come back to you, and, and I know you're a, a director of a research institute. Um, I hear from colleagues and roles that are at a you know, similar position to yourself. Um, that And they tell me uh, over and over again that an enormous amount of time is wasted on laborious grant applications. Um, I know MB, uh, as alluded to by Sidiana, has conducted review into the research space, and that is ongoing. Um, I just wanted to know from your position, um, how could things be improved so that more security could be given and better salaries uh, to early career researchers, those that are coming through uh, the system? Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to first say how much I enjoy being on a panel with Siriana because she keeps talking about collective action. And um, I love what, you know, Chloe articulated in terms of building that space for solidarity. So coming from that uh, perspective, I think that the impetus on grant applications is actually um, uh, sometimes really draining um, of the resources of a center. Um, and oftentimes, in fact, you're absolutely right that the amount of energy that goes into crafting a grant and particularly thinking through uh, the ways in which then you're going to market the grant to the logics of the, uh, 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 the funding agency uh, makes the process uh, laborious, but also um, makes the process sometimes um, um, distant from the actual work of um, doing um, uh, scholarship, you know, so uh, sometimes I feel that particularly in the context of uh, working um, in um, uh, running a center that um, the funding process and the emphasis on grants um, actually uh, sort of takes away from doing the actual work. So there are a few strategies that we use as a center um, at CARE. You know, first is, again, I go back to this idea of refusal and really thinking through how much do we need to sustain? You know, so uh, what are the kinds of resources that are 
going to be necessary to sustain and what kinds of hybrid models can we create to be able to sustain our everyday work. Uh, the second kind of thing is how can we uh, then create a space where uh, the labor of early career researchers at the center is not spent on writing grants and then tied to this idea that if the grant doesn't succeed, then that labor has gone to waste, but really trying to um, safeguard their space so that they can um, they dedicate that time to writing up articles, uh, uh, really mostly peer reviewed articles, because that's where the metric system again seems to have moved, right? But really crafting up that space so that they can have that dedicated time to do that. Um, uh, but in a more broader sense, I think as universities, we need to actually have um, uh, dedicated resources to sustain centers that are not dependent upon grant cycles, uh, because grant cycles are actually uh, quite um, uh, uh, destructive to uh, the academic work, but also, you know, for us in the social sciences, uh, they are um, uh, quite antithetical to doing good social science work. So, you know, at CARE, most of our work is driven in communities. And if you think about it, if you are dependent upon a grant to sustain communities, then, well, when your grant money goes, so does your commitment to the community. So we have to constantly innovate so that we are not dependent upon the grant monies in order to be able to sustain the work. But in a, in a more long-term sense, I think universities really need to change and the state needs to change how it funds universities and how it funds um, uh, the work of research. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you for that, Mohan. And, and you, I, I think you're right there. It's something I hear a lot of that, um, that you know, we've gutted a lot of the administrators that we have at the ground level. So middle management and other management has grown in our in our learning institutions um, and we've talked about that managerialism there's been research done into that which is not it's not just in the tertiary sector it's across the corporate sector as well um, but we don't have a lot of people on the ground and a lot of that work then goes on to sometimes precarious workers but also academics um, and it's perhaps not the best use of their their time to be doing these things thank you Chloe I just wanted to come back to you and, and sort of talk about things from a from a, a government level again or from the position of someone who is in parliament there does seem to be a, a, an inertia uh, if i can from from the current government uh, who have not just favored the status quo as we've talked about since the beginning of the pandemic and how our universities are set up to operate uh, but also how postgraduates are supported or, or not supported we've talked about uh, the failure to reintroduce a postgraduate student allowance we know that's uh, green party policy uh, but also uh, what uh, I just wanted to hear from you what you thought um, we could do um, or propose rather in terms of this ballooning level of, of, of student debt, postgraduate student debt. Well, we could propose to cancel debt, <laughs> uh, which wouldn't be a particularly radical proposal, given that it's already been floated um, in a number of other uh, jurisdictions with uh, massive people powered campaigns to raise the popularity. And it is popular. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about how we go about achieving things that are politically feasible, well, hey, uh, all of these things that we were told were economically or politically or otherwise completely impossible or unachievable happened virtually overnight when COVID-19 hit our shores. We had direct payments to people. We had, you know, flexible working arrangements for people with disabilities or single parents. All of these things that were previously told uh, to these groups who were wanting these things uh, that it was, yeah, unworkable. So um, I think that what is politically possible is all, always a matter of uh, where focus is uh, in our culture. And if we are to look at our culture um, from a design thinking perspective and uh, that defining it as a shared set of values, then we can come to see how our structure and our systems get their supposed legitimacy or their validity. And this is the thing that fascinates me is, um, given everyone's talking about their academic background, for me, it's philosophy. So that's the thing that inter inter interests me and fascinates me about how we can produce political change is that we go to how do we prioritize uh, or enable people to see or reprioritize the kinds of values that we all care uh, about and share 
and we make those the priorities of structures, you create the environment conducive to that structural change by building that solidarity and that people powered movement and putting a spotlight on something by defining what is feasible and achievable. Because obviously we had an environment which was far more akin to the likes of what uh, this report is aiming for, that being something where there were far less barriers to uh, tertiary level education and postgraduate study. Uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, we didn't have student debt like we did today. You, tertiary education was, you know, a nominal fee that nobody had to take out a loan for. So, yeah, I, I very seriously say, how do we uh, respond to ballooning uh, postgraduate debt, uh, student debt and to ballooning student debt at, you know, 16 billion odd the last time I checked? Well, we start to rally for a campaign to cancel it. And if you want to talk about building solidarity, well, why don't we include the $2 billion worth of debt that beneficiaries have accrued, which includes the likes of the debt that they've had to take on for getting into emergency housing. You know, all of these things which seem to be swept under the carpet where the government can find these efficiencies by virtue of putting them on top of uh, really precarious sectors of our society. Uh, we need to raise voices and we need to um, share those stories and we need to build that solidarity. So I think that that's the best way to do it. And the argument for this isn't only um, a values-based one around education as a public good. Um, there's also quite a compelling economic argument for it too, in that uh, we have immense amounts of research. And uh, Laura Walters, actually, I believe in newsroom, uh, at some point last year, right, wrote quite a compelling piece uh, referring to a bunch of research uh, from, I think it was the Levy Institute, uh, who did some macroeconomic modelling, speaking to how, in fact, there are, uh, for those um, conservative right-wing thinkers who may be tuned in to this uh, Education as a Public Good seminar, uh, some some uh, quite profound proof about how, you know, you will see increases in GDP. Um, people will be all the more willing to contribute to the community to get into more stable jobs, that obviously household consumption goes up, uh, and that we also deal with some of those issues around inequity, which the latter they might not care about too much. But hey, there's those economic arguments if that's what we're actually caring about. Kia ora. Thank, thank you, Chloe. So uh, I can summarise this one quite quickly. Uh, cancel student debt uh, and then build solidarity accordingly. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to um, bring Sidiana back into the conversation because we are talking about uh, postgraduates now and, and uh, associated equity issues uh, and some of the difficulties uh, faced by precarious workers in, in academia who are sort of subject to that power imbalance. Um, what do you think universities can do uh, themselves? I mean, or, or perhaps I should say, what do you think universities should do um, as a way to make these precarious roles more appealing, perhaps while we wait uh, for that either incremental or revolutionary change uh, to happen uh, next year after the election? I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the reality is, right, is, is that PhD stipends. Um, we've we've looked at um, we've looked at. I think Max Saw did that paper um, eleven thousand two hundred thirty eight dollars less than a living wage. Um, as a Pacific woman, I happen to know that if you are earning what is um, a PhD stipend or a median Pacific woman's wage, um, you need to go into debt by just over four hundred dollars a week to live in Auckland City by the government's own numbers. By the way, um, so. One of the things that we know and some of the research that I'm doing around the cost of going to university and the survey we ran there is that it's not actually, when we talk about student debt, it's not just government debt. It is credit card loans. It is bank loans. It is family loans. It is um, easy, like it's a quick finance loans. There's just a level of debt that we're not actually accounting for. And part of the way we can fix that is by raising the stipends. And there has been calls for that. And there's been a few people who have responded to that, but also can we start talking about how we haven't changed teaching contracts um, hourly wage for some time? Can we start talking about how research associate rates haven't changed for some time? And if we really do need these qualified people, and it's really important that they have a master's, and it's really important to us that we pay market rate, which is our justification for having VCs on salaries over $500,000 a year, is that it reflects market rate, then can we look at what market rate is for students with masters? Can we look at these sorts of things, right? Like Chloe said, for all of those right-wing think tank people who have joined in, um, if, if this is what's valuable to you, then can we talk about the market rate of a Pacific master's student? Because it's pretty high. Um, and it's all those sorts of things that I think the universities need to start thinking about. Because as someone who, you know, I did my PhD three years ago, um, I did it internationally. I saw what was happening internationally. I was like, please don't let that be happening in Aotearoa. I came back to Aotearoa 
and saw that that's exactly what's happening here, that unsurprisingly, this sort of like global university networks mean that they copy paste the model. So if it's happening in the UK, there'll be a Times Higher Education Summit, our senior management will go over there, learn about how to cost save by cutting by more precarious work, more um, short term contracts, and bring it over here, right? And there's no surprise here. If you want to know what we're doing in five years time, look to the UK, US and Canada. Um, sorry, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, Luke. But what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that we can look at, Chloe pointed to the sort of cancel debt movement internationally, we can look at the different student movements and the different institutional movements pushback that are happening in Australia, happening in the UK, happening in the US and go, okay, what can we learn from that movement? And how can we push our institutions to shift a little bit? Because the threat of wage theft as a court case is a very interesting threat. You know, I've, I, I talk publicly a lot about our institutions. Academic freedom has been great for me. I say all kinds of things about our institutions. This report hit a note. And I think that that's really interesting. It was when we started to talk about the economic impacts of paying graduate students or, or not paying them for their work that people got a little bit sh shook. So more research like this, because I don't actually think that our universities are going to respond overnight to this. They do need to be pushed. There needs to be a national and international lever that pushes them to do this. It's the same with the PBRF. Māori and Pacific academics, they were kind of interested in us, put us on posters. When we got a grant, kind of cool. The moment that PBRF said, said 2.5 was the moment we saw a rash of hirings. Um, and that's the cynical part of me, um, but also the truth. Um, the moment we were with capital was the moment they did something. So we need to think about what is our leverage point to make our universities change, because unfortunately, I don't have an overnight solution for them. I, I think we should increase stipends. I think we should increase the wages. Um, as someone who holds research contracts, that terrifies me because how do I pay for all these things? But also as someone who's recently been a graduate student, maybe we should actually make sure that the cost of doing research is reflective. So we need to make sure that 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 percentage that gets taken off to pay for the institution, maybe that needs to be lowered and we need to pay for the actual work of doing research, not the cost of supporting research. That's some very valid points there. And, and I think if I was to, to summarize that, uh, we're talking about educating our institutions to a degree as to what's going on at ground level. And perhaps there is a bit of a disconnect there uh, in that regard. Um, and something for our unions to advocate on um, and really to lead the charge in this space. Um, as, as precarious workers, uh, we're not making too many conclusions about what's going on. Uh, we've collected the data, we've put a report together, uh, we've presented that. Um, we can you know, make a few sort of, uh, or take the inductive leap, I guess you could say, um, but it's, it's really up to our unions to go, right, okay, this is evidence of this, and this is, the, this is what's required, um, and then drive that on behalf of, of, of the rest of us. Um, I just have one further question uh, for you, Chloe, and I think we'll make that the last one for this, this panel. Uh, I'm bringing back to the conversation uh, or the presentation from Dr. Rita Pana Roy uh, around international students. We've heard stories regarding international student um, exploitation inside and outside of academia, right? So sometimes it's, it's, it's cases where you've got unscrupulous employers outside of academia, unscrupulous landlords uh, that are just taking people for a ride. Um, it, it, on top of that, you know, these students sort of being seen as a stopgap for perhaps a, a lack of, of, of public funding uh, that comes through the, from domestic students. How do we, how do we build back better? I mean, how do we, how do we do this better in the future? And taking into consideration, there's probably not a lot of international students in the country. They're just starting to, to come back in now. Yeah, and, and I'd say to that, you know, those who have been here uh, have had a not very great experience as well. Uh, yeah, just the engagement that I've had, even with international students who've come through uh, my office in the past two years, uh, that I've been the local MP for Auckland Central um, and helping through a range of different issues with institutions. But uh, yeah, even before that, with uh, the tertiary education portfolio have been just eye-watering um, from the way that our immigration system as combined with our tertiary education system prevents our uh, international students from, for example, getting access to um, sexual health uh, through our public health care system um, and a range of other issues. So I think, Luke, the answer to this question is um, to look a little bit broader than just our tertiary education system, as you yourself referenced, you know, um, students are not 
typically just students. They also tend to also be employees. They can also be parents. Um, they tend to they have parents themselves. They are part of a broader community. They may be involved in community organizations. They may be renters. They have responsibilities and they have a life outside of um, tertiary study. And I think part of the problem that uh, this report has identified is that so much of the precariousness inside of our tertiary institutions at present uh, is kind of like a vortex. <laughs> and, and it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy to that extent, you know, particularly when you're talking about the kinds of work that are having to be taken up to, in order to get these stipends and a majority of students not then being able to work other jobs, uh, but being kept at that very low level of income, which then perpetuates the very problem in the first place. So uh, I know that these problems, yeah, are massively, um, massively worse for international students when you combine that with just how callous um, and uncaring our immigration system in particular is. So how do we build back better? Well, we've got to overthrow all of those systems, frankly. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of mahi with um, my colleague Ricardo Menendez March on this one around particularly the intersection of our immigration system um, and our tertiary system and actually also some stuff you might see some, uh, on debt. Uh, but yeah, to, to that effect, I think it's actually not all too dissimilar from the quite unfortunate and unnuanced uh, conversation we're having across the country about our labour shortages. There seems to be this kind of reach for and representation of uh, voices that represent a status quo of exploitation. Uh, and even the Reserve Bank is saying, you know, we've got at or above maximum sustainable employment. We need some more people to potentially exploit. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to speaking to employers and as many others have pointed out to unions and to hospitals and to retail workers about just how it is that we can have an economy that works for all of us because that, that's you know at the end of the day as Siriana and others have said when we're talking about the economy we're not talking about this thing that we have to sacrifice to and to serve we're talking about all of us and the things that we produce so some kind of balance needs to be restored to that and a fundamental part of that is treating tertiary education as a public good. Kia ora, thank you thank you Chloe vortex indeed uh, and um and thank you for touching on the immigration system because I will also uh, make some remarks on that in, in my final few comments. I just want to thank uh, you, each of you again uh, for agreeing to join on the panel today uh, and, and give us your thoughts and your expertise and your commitment, uh, the commitment from each of you uh, when it comes to precarious work in academia and also um, you know adjacent issues in the tertiary education sector. It's appreciated, it's appreciated to have allies in this space uh, that may not have right now that lived experience, uh, but are committed to helping those uh, that, that are living through those particular experiences. So again, uh, thank you for that. Um, as our report launch uh, draws to a close, I, I wanted to wrap up by stating a couple of things. First of all, I want to reiterate the appreciation of our group for the wide number of people who have made both the report possible today um, and it was the report possible uh, and also the launch uh, today possible. Um, so again, uh, NZUSA, TEU, uh, various academic allies, um, and also the, the Centre for Cultural Centred uh, Approaches to Research and Evaluation at Massey University. Second of all, uh, and this is a, a sort of a final uh, thought or, or anecdote from me on behalf of the group, this is my last act in academia. Um, I submitted my PhD last week and next week I start a job in the public sector. After nearly 10 years, uh, I personally, I couldn't bear the thought of contract work any longer and, and decided that at some point nearing 40, um, I wanted to save for a house. Um, and it's something that my wife and I decided was, was the right decision to make. Um, I don't need a PhD uh, in my new role, although I'm sure it will be useful, uh, nor was it what I envisaged doing with my life when I returned to university almost a decade ago. I want to teach politics. It's what I like doing. Um, it's one of the few things uh, that I do like doing and for which I've been recognised for doing so. Bittersweet for me, on one hand, uh, that I won't be teaching any longer. But on the other hand, I'm going on to employment that is both permanent and well remunerated. But I don't share this anecdote to talk about myself. I am one of the privileged ones. I had the capacity to advocate for the past two years with my friends and colleagues in tertiary education action group, Aotearoa, and cognate groups like NZUSA and so on. Um, and I had that opportunity to do that, to talk about how academia could be better. I had the time, capacity, 
uh, to do that. I might have uh, pushed off my PhD uh, a little bit more than what I should have, but uh, I still had that opportunity. I was on a scholarship during my PhD, uh, and when necessary, I had the benefit uh, of borrowing against my student loan. I might have 100k student debt, but I still have some agency. I want to circle back again uh, to the comments from Dr. Roy, who talked about multifaceted precarity. I was in a conversation with a friend and his wife, who, like my wife and I, Dr. Roy, uh, both have their PhDs. But instead of working in academia or even in an adjacent field, his wife was working part time as a social worker and he was working as a cleaner. They are both former international students. With young children in tow, this family faces the unenviable situation of not being able to return to their country of origin, largely due to the nature of their PhD work research, which would be considered controversial back home, uh, being financially vulnerable due to the rising cost of living um, that we know about across Aotearoa, being stuck in an immigration logjam, uh, which is presenting them uh, having the capacity uh, to apply for other jobs, uh, despite spending close to a decade in the country. And on top of all of that, uh, working extraordinary hours and roles that you could safely argue uh, that they're perhaps overqualified to be doing. They're not snobbish about these things, by the way. They're not bitter or upset. Um, but it's fair to say that some of their circumstances aren't particularly pleasant. It is them who I would argue alongside those in Aotearoa, uh, those domestic students who did not win the birth lottery of comfortable status, who we must prioritise moving forward. We must centre equity. Our government and our learning institutions ought to do and provide more support. Those who have made incredible sacrifices to study, have accomplished remarkable things under such circumstances, uh, should not also find themselves in what I would refer to as extremely difficult sets of circumstances. To plan the words of our Prime Minister and the party she leads, let's do better. That's all for today from myself and the team. Thank you again for listening. Namahi.